two minutes goes by in a hurry. Colossians chapter 1, last week we began this section of Colossians where Paul gives us the privilege of looking in on his prayer for the church. And we noted that one of the ways to develop what we believe is by studying the prayers of the Bible. That's a great way to really develop our theology by simply looking at all the prayers throughout the Bible. For example, um, if we want to develop a theology of God's patience, then it makes sense to just look at King David's prayer where he says that you are abounding in love and slow to anger. Uh, Also, if we wanted to develop a theology of what forgiveness should look like in our lives, it's good to study Jesus's prayer that he taught his disciples to pray when he prays and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And so certainly when we look at prayers in the Bible, that helps us develop what we personally believe. It's almost a shortcut. You could read an entire story in the Bible and learn about God's patience, or you could just read simple prayers. And because of that, we noted last week that as Paul begins to pray for this church in Colossae, beginning with Colossians 1, 9, we noted that there was a theology of growth that sort of rose to the surface. We, we noted in these words, these, these words in his prayer, that God is concerned with our maturity. God wants us to grow up. And when we ask the question, how, how do we grow? Within this prayer, we noted in verse 10 that we're, we're supposed to walk in a worthy manner. That's part of our growth. We also noted that we're to please the Lord. That's part of our growth. And while many Christians sometimes get nervous about, okay, us pleasing the Lord or working hard in our own growth, we sort of ended last week by just quoting someone that I found very helpful in this whole discussion, Dallas Willard, who reminds us that grace is not opposed to effort, it's opposed to earning. And so that brings us to continuing this prayer. And today I want to go all the way to verse 14. So follow along with me. Just to get in the context again, let's start with verse 9 yet again. Colossians 1 verse 9. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance Of the saints in light. He has delivered us, verse 13, from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And may God add his blessing to the reading of the word this morning. Amen. He who began a good work in you is faithful to explain it. No, that's not what Philippians 1.6 says. Those of you who've memorized Philippians 1.6, you know that it says, He who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. But occasionally, we'll run into verses of the Bible that talk about how God completes His work in us. Exactly how does he do that? And in this prayer, I want us to see that one of the ways God completes his work in us is by working through us. Let me say that again. One of the ways that God completes his work in us is by working through us. And so when we ask the question like, how in my Christian life do I grow to maturity how does growth happen? This passage 
gives us a, an idea of exactly how God does that. And so um, if it's helpful, I just want to bring out four points this morning. These are on the back of your bulletin. Number one is the process of growth. Number two, the source of growth. Number three, the question, is it me working or him? And number four, thanksgiving to the Father. And so number one, let's look at the process of growth that we see as we pick up, especially beginning in verse 10 of this passage. The process of growth. You know, when a mom has her first baby, everything is a brand new discovery. And whether she is in the office of her OBGYN or whether she's later in the office of her child's pediatrician, a brand new mom is all ears concerning what happens in growth with the baby. She's all ears concerning what happens at two months and six months and 12 months and whether that doctor has a chart on the wall or gives the mom a handout, she just digests all the information she can. Why? Because she loves her child and she is concerned with the child's growth. But of course, in the very early stages of that, her OBGYN will go back in time, will go back to explain what has already happened, even beginning with conception. And that doctor will explain, you know, actually, nourishment has already started. Blood circulation has already started. And, and the fingertips of that baby have, have already begun to develop ridges and circles and arches that before the baby is even four inches long, the baby has fingerprints. And so that doctor will begin to, from fingerprints all the way to showing the mom the wonderful images of the ultrasound, the doctor is talking about growth that has already been happening. And I bring that experience up because as we see Paul pray for growth in these verses, it's important to notice that he's praying for a process that's already in motion. In fact, yes, he's praying for future growth, but growth has already begun. Here's where I see that. Look, notice in the middle of verse 10, Paul prays that they will bear fruit in every good work. But in verse 6, Paul is thankful for what reason? The gospel is already bearing fruit through this church. Also in the middle of verse 9, Paul prays that they would be filled with God's knowledge. But interestingly, in chapter 2, verse 10, he comments that they've already been filled. Paul is praying for a process that is already in motion. In fact, if you look down at the end of verse 10, Paul clearly desires them to be increasing in knowledge. And that phrase, increasing in knowledge, really should put in our minds the idea of something that's forever happening. It's continually happening. Increasing in knowledge. One New Testament scholar by the name of G.K. Beale says this concerning that phrase, This is not circular reasoning, but more like a spiral. Knowledge of God leads to good works and then to even greater knowledge of God. And so, in a way, that points to what everyone in this room, if you are a Christian, if you're a believer in Christ, you go through this. And when we think of our own growth, when we think of our own maturity, we really should not think of a chart that has a line that just goes straight up, maturing, maturing, maturing. Rather, sort of similar to what Dr. Beale is saying, Paul is describing something more circular, more circular. It's, it's a process, it's a motion that very slowly begins to go up, maturing more and more and more. Or if you're like me, it, it might more be like a loop-to-loop that's -loop. slowly going up. Because there are seasons in our life where we grow in Christ wonderfully, but then we tend to plateau. And then maybe a year or two later, we're growing in Christ, but then it almost seems like we're going backwards. But we dust ourselves off, we pick ourselves up, and grow in Christ more and more and more. Again, Paul is clearly describing a process 
as we talk about growth. That's number one. I want us to see that very clearly. Number two, however, we see the source of growth, which, big surprise, it's Christ himself. Now, where do we see that? Well, in the middle of verse 10, as Paul prays for the church to bear fruit in every good work, that ought to get our attention. He, he, he first prays that we're going to please the Lord, that we walk in a worthy manner. But when we read this word, bear fruit, those words, bear fruit in all things, that ought to stop us in our tracks. And that's sort of the reason I stopped there last week and am continuing with that phrase this week. Here's why. If we are bearing fruit, it is for one reason and one reason only. It's because we're abiding in Christ. In fact, you don't have to turn there, but John 15, Jesus says, I am the true vine. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in me. Neither can you unless you abide in the vine. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. What is the source of our growth as we mature? It's Christ. It's always Christ. We are to be abiding in the vine, connected to the taproot of Jesus Christ himself. And Jesus felt like this was so important That if you just take the words bear fruit together, in the Gospels, Jesus talks about that 23 times. So this is important. Our source of growth is Christ himself. Well, that leads us to our next point, which today I'm going to pose as a question. Is it me working or him? Okay, Pastor Greg, you've talked about this process of growth, and the question I have is, Is it me working or him? Is it me working or Christ in me? Is it me doing the work or is it the Father? Is it me working or is it the Holy Spirit? Now, the reason that question comes up in the first place is because look again at verse 10. This is what we pointed out last week. We clearly see that we are to walk in a worthy manner. We clearly see that we are to please the Lord. Verse 11 tells us that we are to endure. And Paul applies this active language to his own life. In 1 Corinthians 15.10, for example, he says, I worked harder than any of them. Talking about not only his ministry, but him working to please the Lord. But if we look carefully at this prayer we also see language that shows us we're also on the 100% receiving end of this growth. Look at verse 12. The Father qualified you to share in the inheritance. The Father qualified you. You did nothing to earn that. That is the Father's work in you. Look at verse 13. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. Who did the delivering? God the Father. Who did the transferring? God. So is it me working, or is it him? You know, no illustration perfectly is adequate to sort of give a picture of all of this, but for a moment, I'm going to borrow that image again of the baby growing. Because the baby grows in the womb, and then the baby is born and continues to grow two months, six months, 12 months. And while it's evident that the baby's growth is dependent on the mother, I have a question for you. Is the baby truly and actively working? Is the baby putting forth effort to mature? Is physically the baby contributing to that while absolutely the baby is totally dependent on the mother well the the answer is yes the baby is working the baby is contributing to that growth as little and tiny as the baby might be and while again no illustration is perfectly adequate to to give this a parallel 
I want us to apply that to our spiritual growth. Because while we would be very quick to say we are totally dependent on God, do we work concerning our growth? Are we active concerning our growth? Do we use our will, our volition concerning our growth? The answer is yes. And we might call that sanctification. In fact, if if that's a word that's new to you, I just encourage you maybe to jot it down in your notes. Write it on your bulletin. Sanctification. Is it he working or is it me working? When we're talking about the growth process, the answer is both. Is it me working or is it he working? When we're talking about sanctification, the answer is both. But as we talk about the full scope of what salvation is, I want us to realize that if our sanctification is like a growing baby who can sometimes kick and scream, but sometimes can submissively suckle for milk, our initial call from God would be more like our conception. Our conception. So, Understand this with me. Does the baby have anything to do with being conceived? No. The baby has nothing to do with conception. The baby has nothing to do with whether or not the mom and the dad were from a certain social economical background. The baby has nothing to do with whether or not the mom and dad were black or white or Asian or from some particular country, the baby has absolutely nothing to do with that. And in the same way, we have nothing to do with our initial call of God that brought forth our life. You know, if you're from this area, if you live anywhere close to Denton Highway, you know that this church is less than a mile from some train tracks. And uh, some of you, if you're like me, uh, spend many hours of your life, it seems like, being stuck behind a train. In fact, just a few nights ago, I was late to our son Rowan's choir concert because I was stuck behind a train. But for just a moment, I want you to imagine a train that's on the tracks completely stopped. And then picture the engine at the front beginning to move when that engine begins to move how long does it take for all of the other cars to begin moving well it's almost instantaneous i mean you hear this clicking and clanking of the couplers slamming together car after car after car after car but it it seems like all of the cars on the track begin to move instantaneously but It's dependent, it's 100% dependent on the engine at the front moving. There has to be a first initial mover to get everything else going. And in the same way, you and I have a salvation because of God's movement. Not ours, God's movement. You know, as Roman Catholic monks like Martin Luther began to question the Roman doctrine of salvation, one of the first things that the Reformers clarified was that salvation has an order to it. This was very crucial in rightly understanding what justification truly does. And the engine of our salvation, the locomotive that's way down at the far end of the track that's responsible for the movement of everything else is God's initial call of us. And another word for that is the word regeneration. Another word you might want to jot down, regeneration. Without that initial call, without regeneration, we are like that train that I was stuck behind a few nights ago. It was not moving at all. Sometimes when I'm stuck behind a train, I'll roll down my window just to hear if there's anything going on. Well, this train... You couldn't even hear steam coming from anything. It was dead on the tracks. If your Bibles are open to Colossians 1, turn one page over to Colossians 2 and look at verse 13 with me. 
And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive. God made alive. Would you say those three words with me? God made alive. Does a baby have anything to do with conception? No. Do I have anything to do with God's initial call that makes me alive? No. Does the baby have anything to do after conception with future growth and maturity? Yes. As, as ultra-dependent on the mother as she or he is, the baby does work, is active, does have something to do with maturity. Do I, after that initial calling, and in a moment I'm going to show you the initial work of a couple of other things, do I have anything to do in sanctification with my growth? Absolutely so. Even though I'm ultra-dependent on God's Spirit, I play a part. And so the Reformers would have said that the Ordo Salutis, that's Latin for the order of salvation, is in three or four parts. And on the screen, let me just note that number one, it would be initial call. The initial call of God, or we might call that regeneration. Number two, faith. Number three, justification. Number four, sanctification. And today we're not going to talk about it, but there would even be a fifth point of our salvation called glorification, meaning God takes us all the way to heaven. Our salvation's not over until we're in glory with him. But folks, let's be clear for a moment. The reformers taught all of that because they read it in Paul. They read it in Peter and John and Jesus himself. For example, what does Paul say in Romans 5.1? Since we have been justified by faith... We have peace in God. Folks, we were justified by faith. But I want you to notice something. We would not have that faith if we were not first regenerated. In fact, to the Ephesians, Paul says it like this. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, but that's not of yourself. It's a gift from God. You know, as all of that happens... And and I would just go ahead and say, similar to all of those cars on the train track, while the order is crucially important, it would appear that it just all happens instantaneously. When you were saved, however, were you aware of all that happening? Probably not. When I was saved, and for me it was as an eight-year-old boy, I have to be honest with you, I didn't know the order of any of this. All I knew is I made a decision for Christ. All I knew is that there was a Sunday scheduled on the calendar that my parents told me I was going to be baptized. And yes, I had an understanding that I have a sin problem. And Jesus is the Savior to not just cover my sins, but to take away my sins. Folks, that's a good deal. I signed up for that, but that doesn't mean I understood every single thing that happened in the process. But folks, one of the things that in my mind clarifies and helps us understand our role, not in the first three steps, but in the fourth, in sanctification, is to realize that in God's mind there is an order. That's why all the glory goes to him for our salvation. Now, for some of you here, this is review. Words like regeneration, And justification and faith and sanctification, this is review. But for a moment, I want to give some quotes. And I'm just going to slam them all up on the screen. Helpful quotes from authors and theologians. Because sometimes when we hear other personalities describe this kind of thing in their own language, it helps us. So here's what Jerry Bridges would have to say about this. Jerry Bridges says, Sanctification very much involves our activity. But it is an activity that must be carried out in dependence on the Holy Spirit. It is not a partnership with the Spirit in the sense that we each, the believer and the Holy Spirit, do our equally respective tasks. Rather, 
We work as he enables us to work. His work lies behind all our work and makes our work possible. He's not dependent on us to do his work, but we are dependent on him to do our work. Here's what Jen Wilkin says about the subject of sanctification. Our sanctification is ongoing. It's a slow-moving growth in holiness. But we have been given the deposit of the Holy Spirit. We who were once slaves to sin's power are now free to serve God. We don't always use our freedom. We still sin. But over time, we learn increasingly to choose holiness. Here's another voice. C.J. Mahaney says it like this. Sanctification is a process, the process of becoming more like Christ, of growing in holiness. This process begins the instant you are converted and will not end until you meet Jesus face to face. Sanctification is about our own choices and behavior. It involves work. Empowered by God's Spirit, we strive, we fight sin, we study Scripture and pray, even when we don't feel like it, we flee temptation, we press on, we run hard in the pursuit of holiness. Here's what Jackie Hill Perry says about this subject. Holiness is what makes real love towards God possible. Without it, love is purely sentimental. We will want and choose to put to death what is earthly in us when we believe God is infinitely better than everything else. One more, Kevin DeYoung says, we must never separate justification and sanctification. Justification will always produce sanctification, and sanctification will always flow from justification. And yet, we should not be afraid to talk about how both are different. Justification calls us to rest. Sanctification calls us to fight. Justification declares us righteous before God. Sanctification makes us righteous as we live in this world. Or to say it differently, justification is Jesus telling the judge in the courtroom, she is innocent. Sanctification is you walking out of the courtroom walking in a new lifestyle. He who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. Yes, and amen, that's absolutely true, but folks, occasionally, God gives us places in Scripture of explaining how he completes it. And the good news about today's prayer meditation, as we look at this prayer of Paul's that's a theology of growth is that God completes his work in you by working through you. You play a part in your sanctification. You play a part in effort given to defeat sin in your life. Oh, you are ultra dependent on the Holy Spirit. It is breaking habits and abiding in Christ all the time. It is walking in newness and abiding in Christ all the time. It is enduring even when it gets tough and temptations are almost unbearable while abiding in Christ all of the time. And get this, this to me is a mystery. It's a mystery I don't understand, but it's what Paul is really saying. The fact that God will glorify all of us here who have trusted in Christ is 100% a promise of God. He who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. If he has begun a good work in you, it will be completed. But here's the mystery. While by faith we cling on to that promise, the Christian life is auto not automatic. Promise, yes. Automatic, no. God has called us to play a part in our sanctification. So after Paul says all of that in his prayer, well, what is left for Paul to say? Thanksgiving to the Father. Number four, look at verse 12 with me. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints 
in light. Ladies and gentlemen, that's talking about your heavenly home. That's talking about my heavenly home. If I have said yes to Christ, if I have come to the end of myself and seen that I am unable to do anything about my sin problem and I need a Savior, Paul is talking about my heavenly home. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, on this Thanksgiving week, we have so much to be thankful for, but we would be presumptuous and foolish to not specifically thank you for our salvation. Thank you that you began it, not with us seeking after you, rather we were running away from you, and yet in your kindness you found us and you lifted us up out of the muck and mire of our own sin, of our own selfishness. So this morning, Lord, we say thank you for our salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.